about myself, this book, my disease, these steps, and especially about you, dear God, so that I might have an open mind and a new experience with all these things. Please help me to see the truth. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, so we've been uh, looking at what am I turning over? How am I turning things over? What it, what does that actually mean? Um, kind of the difference between surrender and abandon. Uh, we always have a choice. Um, and so that part of abandonment is like actually giving up the, the choosing to, to leave the, the building that was and uh, enter into a new building, a new, a, new, a new framework, a new everything. And so we've been looking at what does it mean to turn over? What am I turning over? And, and we looked at our intellect, which causes our belief system, which uh, leads us into our, our, what motivates us, our motives, which leads us into our thinking. And that's our will. Uh, our will comes from somewhere and it comes from out of our belief system. And, and, then, and, and then what we wanted to talk about today was emotions. And so how am I led by my emotions? What am I, what's leading the show? What am I plugged into? What's powering me? Um, what's motivating me? And so I heard it say in a speaker meeting, I want to be motive free. And I've like, I've been really wrestling with that. Like, what does that actually mean to be uh, motiveless? Um, and, and so I'm trying to reconcile that in my own spirit of like, can somebody be motiveless? Um, and, and so I look at uh, people that I've worked with and I try to motivate them. And so where I have to motivate somebody is really hard uh, because I, I want recovery for them more than they want recovery. And so I'm always trying to motivate that person to, to do the homework, to do the questions, to be on time and, and that kind of thing. So I, as I reconcile it, motivation, like I can't motivate myself uh, enough to continue to do all the right things. I have to actually be motive, mo motivated by the spirit of God. I have to be led by the spirit of God. I was reading in, uh, in my Bible today about, um, the, the prophet Simeon at the, at the temple. And he woke up in the morning and he had this promise uh, from God. And the promise was, uh, you will die a nice, beautiful death and you'll be taken up on the wings of angels on the clouds uh, when you see the, the Savior, when you see the Messiah. And so this is uh, the birth of Jesus and the Gospel of Luke re recalls this story. And, um, and, and Simeon woke up that day and, you know, Jesus just happened to be at the temple. Uh, with his parents um, as they did their, um, you know, they, 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 they do the traditions of giving the firstborn uh, back to God uh, in, in, in the sign of, you know, in the remembrance of coming out of slavery. It's a beautiful story about, you know, just the redemption and, and you know, when they were slaves in Egypt for, for so long, uh, and were led out of Egypt. There was, for them to be led out of Egypt, there was uh, the Passover, and that's where the the angel of death killed the firstborn if you didn't have the blood of a lamb on the on your doorpost. And so that's actually what le caused and led uh, the people to be uh, free into the desert. And so that was just a reminder of uh, in the Jewish community they they would give back the firstborn to God. And there is a little bit of a ceremony, almost like, you know, a christening or a, a, an infant baptism only, almost. Um, there, there was a bit of a ceremony. So Jesus had happened to be at the temple. Um, and, and so Simeon was led by the Spirit of God, led by the Spirit of God to show up there. And, um, you know, as soon as he saw Jesus, he took him and just said, this is the Savior. This is the light of the world. This is what's going to lead the world uh, to the Father. And, uh, and, and, and then, you know, he, he, was, he was led by the Spirit. And so um, do I want to miss, do I miss opportunities by being led by my emotions, by being led by self-will? Do I, do I lose do I lose opportunities to see God's glory and God's purpose and God's um, meaning and, and understanding and wisdom when I'm caught up in my uh, emotions? Because a lot of times that's what's leading me. And, and if you can think about your addiction um, and, and think back a little ways, uh, how you were being led and what was guiding you. And, and I can think back and, and, you know, I don't, I don't try to, think about my addiction a lot. Like I like to try to share my recovery and think about my recovery a lot more. 
Um, but I can think back when, you know, I, I would get high and drunk and then this didn't feel right. So I would have to add this and this, and, and then I would have to drink more of this. And then I, I like, I was looking for this perfect balance of, uh, emotional numbness. And then when I wasn't using, you know, I, I was kind of a bender guy. And so I could, I could, I could not do anything for a, a week or so. Um, uh, maybe two weeks maximum, uh, or even a couple days, but my emotional barometer, my emotions inside of me, I would become very heightened, almost like a roller coaster. I would have highs and lows and, uh, I would start getting antsy and I would start pacing and I would start, you know, creating arguments at home with my wife. And I was looking for reasons for this heightened emotion to be led. And so I would be led to the liquor store. I would be led to the, to the beer store. I would be led to the pub uh, to sit with the boys. And uh, I didn't miss a lot of opportunities being led by my emotions um, because it was always the, the end of it was to numb them. And so that's what it was like for me to be led by my emotions, my addiction. And, and that's what life was created out of. And so if I'm still in, 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 if, if I'm sober and, and what's really running the show, what am I being led by now? Um, the, the whole point is to have a new connection, to have a uh, new power and to be run and fueled by God. That's how we were designed. We were designed to be powered. We were designed to be filled and we were designed to be guided um, and, and led. And so we can either do that with our emotions. We can do that with our intellect. Um, that's our mind. And we, we do that with our will. So wherever our will, whatever our will is plugged into is really what's going to guide us and really what's going to power us. And so that's really what we're trying to turn over is we're turning over our will and our actions follow our thinking. So our, our will in our lives. And so what does it mean to be controlled or led by my emotions? Most of us can relate to being led by our emotions for most of our lives. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. I, I think the, the, biggest, the biggest emotion that we're led by, and even in my recovery today, you know, I, I'm going back through step four and, and I'm doing it with a group, but I, I also have a sponsor that is familiar with a certain way of, of going through the uh, inventories of resentment and, and that kind of thing. And what it's leading me to do is, you know, he's asked me to pick 10 resentments. And so, you know, when I came into this class, uh, when I came into this group, I was like, well, 10 resentment, that's kind of hard. Like, you know, I'm pretty holy and I've been in recovery for a long time. Like, I don't know, like maybe the other people in the group, they, they probably could find 20, but me, I like maybe one or two, but they're not really, they're not really a big thing. Um, but he got me to look at, um, you know, even people that uh, let me down or people that rob me, rub me the wrong way, or people that steal my time um, or, or people that I feel superior to, or people that I feel inferior to. Um, our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous actually kind of defines resentment in a bunch of things. One, it's uh, it's a refeeling over and over. Um, so uh, it also says that um, kind of the definition of resentment, like what are we resentful for? What are what are the things of define resentment? Um, they they say situations that burn me up, uh, people that I hold a grudge against, uh, people that injure me, uh, things that make me angry, hurt. Uh, parts of me that feel threatened or inferior to um, or, or make me sore, um, you know. And so I was able to, you know, 14 years into my recovery, just put down 10 resentments. And uh, it was really interesting because there's two, three of them that I'm really working through that uh, all at the end of it lead to a fear. And wherever there's fear in, in, in the Bible, it says, a uh, perfect love cast out all fear. And that's the love of God. That's the love of Jesus that casts out all fear within me. And so I, I was getting a couple of these to the bottom of these resentments. And there's some core fears there. And fear is what's separating me from God. And so is fear separating me from God? Am I, am I getting these new fears or did I always have them because of my separation from God? Um, I think these fears have been there. And so 
when I get to the bottom and I'm like, oh man, I, like, how am I even sober? Uh, I'm, I'm disconnected from God in, in, in these big areas of my life. And so I've had to reconcile that and, and just go, man, it's God's grace. This, this is a process. This is, you know, you, we don't arrive. It's circular. It's not linear. I'm never looking up or down at, at anybody. I'm, I'm level and, and it's just circular. And, and so I'm starting to bring these fourth step issues, these fourth step fears, these fourth step step emotions which is actually leading the show and i'm bringing my fourth step problem to a third step solution which is making a decision to turn them over to god and so i actually that's my part is i have to decide and to be willing to go i have this fear that's running my show the this fear that's leading me this fear that's this part of me that's disconnected from god I actually have to see that and be willing to decide to turn that over to God. And I can't get rid of the fear. That's a beautiful thing about this relationship. It's not about what I can do, but it's about what God's going to do. And it's about what God's already done. And so where there's perfect love, there is no fear. It casts out all fear. Uh, so the beautiful thing that I've reconciled with is... Um, because sometimes I think I'm doing a lot better than I actually am. But what I've reconciled is in our literature, it says uh, we continue to enlarge our spiritual life. And so if my spiritual life is as large as life can get, then I got nowhere to grow. I got nowhere uh, to continue um, enlarging, you know? So that's kind of where I'm at is like, I want to get stronger. I want to, uh, continue this journey and and really be powered by God. I want to be yeah. like Simeon in the Bible and and like I want to see the the light of the world. I want to see the Savior of the world. I want to I want to be able to be drawn into the temple um, and be really powered by God and being led by God on a daily basis. When I wake up, when I go to sleep, I don't want to be filled with self pity. I know that sometimes my emotions. Um, can creep in and I'm full of self-pity in the morning like oh so early oh uh, other people in my household get to sleep in they don't do this I have to do this you know I have to clean the house in the morning I have to do all this stuff and I'm actually full of self-pity I'm full of self I'm full of emotion and it can it can be traced back to that I, I don't get comfort from God that I'm separated from God and so there's still parts of my life that are separated and disconnected from God. And so that's where we're at today is uh, looking at um, what we're turning over as a whole. And we looked at the three parts of us were made in the image of God. God has three parts. We have three parts. We have a physical body. We have a soul. That's our mind, will, and emotion. And we have a spirit. That We want to be led by the spirit of God through our spirit. And so that's really what we want to connect to. And, and so um, our fear actually separates us from God. So did we, does fear separate us or does separation cause the fear? And so what I'm trying to really understand is that my actual separation from God, even when I was born, we came in this world, into this broken world, separated from God, period, all of us. And so that's a beautiful thing is that God has come to save and restore a broken relationship. So our relationship starts off, uh, I, I'm, I'm in my spirit, I'm disconnected from God right from the get-go. And so I think that my fear actually has been caused by the separation. I don't just get these fears um, throughout my life and, and according to my belief system, yeah, I can, I can add new fears. Um, you know, we have tons of fears that we're driven by fear of punishment, fear of abandonment, uh, fear of not being good enough, fear of, of being alone, fear of success, fear like there's so much fear uh, that we have, but we all start with the same fear of disconnected by God. And the whole point of recovery is to have a spiritual connection to God. That's the whole point of this is I want to not be powered by self-will but I want to be powered by God's will. And so that's a beautiful thing that we get to do in recovery is uh, really go through the process of finding our fears and, and then inviting God into them 
and then having the blocks to God removed. And then our spirit connects with his spirit. And that's where we start to be powered by him. That's where the promises of you will know comfort, you will know peace, you will know purpose, all of those, uh, all of those promises, you actually be transformed into a different person. And so just like alcohol transformed me into a different person, you know, I, I grew up in, I grew up in, my dad was a pastor. I grew up in the church. And so uh, when I started drinking in grade uh, 10 and 11, and you know, it was a year where my parents, a year of drinking caused my parents not to know me anymore. They said, where is our sweet little John? Where's our sweet little boy that, you know, is always participating in the kitchen and, and always keeping his room uh, clean and, and, you know, helping out around the house and not being told to have to do anything and not miserable and moping around. And, you know, you're disappearing for three days and we don't know your friends anymore. They didn't know I was a different person. And so that's what recovery offers us is, you know, as we abandon this old person, we become a new person uh, and we're, we're raised back to life. Um, that that's the hard part. We have to actually abandon all of our thinking, all of our belief system, what it is to be a man, what it is to be me, um, all of our ideals and our values. We actually get to be transformed and changed. That's a beautiful thing because it's nothing you can do. And so this is all about inviting God into the restoration process. And so uh, we, we are apart from him. We are separated from him. We are disconnected from him right from the get-go. So we're going to look at uh, maybe a couple lessons down the road. We're going to look at the spiritual sickness, uh, really what that looks like. So in this time, we just want to understand how things operate and how things work. Um, what does it actually mean to turn over my will? Uh, what is that? What are you asking me to do, uh, people of recovery? Uh, so the one out of three parts of my soul is the emotions. And so the emotions run the show for, for the most part. Most of us can relate to that. Um, uh, what is our emotions? The emotions that we have, uh, you know, I've, I've had to change some of my, my writings in, in uh, my workbook. Um, and and I, I said there's good and bad emotions, like different classifications. And, and there are, you know, in psychology, they, they can break up your emotions uh, into five categories or eight categories. Uh, the, the, the style that I've chosen is nine different categories of emotions. And so at, at the beginning, I, I used to say we got good and bad emotions. I've had to reconcile that and say we have pleasant and unpleasant emotions because our emotions have are all God given. They've all come from God. They 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 are designed by God. Um, and there's no bad emotions, but some are unpleasant and some are pleasant. And so what I've come to realize is that the way of our world today is that we don't have unpleasant emotions. We need to be happy. And and if you're if you're suffering, that's a source of shame because none of us should suffer. This is uh, we're in Canada. We're in the land of milk and honey. Uh, we we have privilege upon privilege of education and finances, and it doesn't matter who you are. You're entitled to money of the government, even if you're on welfare or ODSP. We are a very blessed nation, and and so uh, we 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 have the ability. Um, to really always be happy and always we don't want to feel pain and our social media accounts is like our, our best picture our best side um, look at my selfie look how happy I am and that's what we show the world around us but the reality is mo what we're going to learn is that there's more unpleasant emotions than there are pleasant emotions and and I think there's a reason for that I think the reason is that suffering is great Suffering is, is good. It, imagine if you were uh, going to the gym and, and in two months or two, two years from now or two, two months from now, uh, whatever the timeline is, you were, you were going to fight for the uh, heavyweight belt of the world, uh, for the UFC. You're, you're a UFC fighter all of a sudden. And uh, you're, you're in the lightweight category, the heavyweight category. And uh, you've been just living your life not to fight for the heavyweight belt. And now you go to the gym and you have a trainer. Imagine you just sat there and go, well, 
the way we're working out and the aspiring, like it actually hurts. This isn't, this isn't happy. This is suffering. Um, and so I would rather not do that. I would rather just go to the gym, take some selfies, do some poses, you know, impress some people, do some grunting and all that stuff and, and mainly sit on the bench and, and maybe do a little bit of wrestling um, and get some hydration and make a protein shake and, and all of that beautiful stuff. I would rather, I would rather do that um, because, you know, tearing my muscles and doing the cardio to fight a heavyweight championship is not, doesn't make me happy. And so the beautiful thing is that suffering, uh, tearing our muscle, to, like ripping our lungs out, uh, pushing our bodies to the limit, it actually uh, builds and strengthens us. And so, um, you know, there's there's relationships that we actually have to work through. There's conflict that we have to work through. And, and that's what Jesus doesn't promise us to be happy. He says, you will be comforted. Uh, you will know peace. Um, you know, I, I will take away, uh, wipe away your tears. And so he'll bring joy and not happiness necessarily. It's, 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 God doesn't promise us happiness. He promises a, a journey of, of carrying your cross to your death. That's the experience that he promises. And so uh, out of that comes joy, out of sacrifice, out of struggle, out of uh, all of that, those hardships actually come the joy of overcoming what I couldn't before instead of I'm just going to give up because it doesn't make me happy. So that's kind of like a, a small example on how my emotions run the show. And so here are the, um, here are the, 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 the categories of emotions. And so uh, we have anger, we have sadness, we have fear. And so out of these categories, there's a whole lot of uh, different emotions under that. So, you know, with anger, you have fury, hostility, irritability, annoyance, and then sadness is a category on its own grief, self-pity, despair, loneliness. We got fear. And so a lot of us are familiar with this one. Um, in my life, uh, pre-recovery, uh, I would never say I had fear. I would say that I lived against fear. And then when I got into recovery and I'm like three months in and I'm, I'm working this recovery thing and there was one, I, I forget, there was a class and, and I just started laughing because it was on this fear. And I realized that my whole life was on a foundation of fear. And so I was, I was perpetuating, I knew that in my spirit, I knew that this fear was here, like subconsciously, you know, if whatever you're built on, you subconsciously know it. And so I would, I would make sure that no one knew that I had fear. I was very aggressive. I was, I was the guy at the party that was going to jump off the second story into the pool. I was going to make sure that no one knew that I had any fear. And I remember in this class, the teacher's teacher, I just start laughing. I'm like, I burst out laughing because I, I, it's like I could see myself and I had whipped cream all over my face and I was just walking through life with whipped cream, trying to prove to everybody that I had no whipped cream on my face. And so um, fear, the category, you know, surrounds anxiety, edginess, nervousness, fright, terror, apprehension, and, and really coming to understand that that's what my life was fueled on uh, in my addiction. So that's what was leading me. That's what uh, I needed relief from. Um, and then getting into all the things that provide that in a very quick way. Uh, we got enjoyment uh, under that category. We got joy, relief, contentment, delight, thrill, euphoria, love. Um, so love's a category, acceptance, trust, devotion, adoration, surprise, shock, amazement, and wonder are under those. And then we got disgust. So that's contempt, scorn, aversion, revulsion. And then we got shame. Uh, under that category, we got guilt, remorse, humiliation, embarrassment, um, those kind of things. And then for the final category, we got um, vulnerability, um, unease, nervousness. Um, and so out of these nine categories, what we'll see is whatever, you, however you want to label them. But for the most part, when we go through them, six out of the nine or five out of the nine are unpleasant. Uh, I don't know about you, 
But when you wake up, do you feel looking forward to feeling insecure? Do you look forward to feeling sadness? Or do you wake up and just go, I hope, I hope I get a whole cup of anger today. Like, I just want to get a pot of anger. I want to get a boiling pot of anger and I want to dump it on myself. I want to dump it on the world around me. I want to wake up and I want to feel disgust. Those are emotions that I don't necessarily, I don't look forward to feeling. You know, I want to wake up and feel enjoyment. Woo, give me some enjoyment today. I want a nice sandwich of enjoyment. I want to feel loved. Uh, maybe, I, I don't mind being surprised, you know, getting a little surprise here and there. But surprise, I don't necessarily want to always be surprised. I don't want to always be wondering or being shocked. <laughs> I don't always want to have surprise, but it, I'm not saying it's pleasant or unpleasant. It's probably more on the pleasant side. Um, but some of these ones, I just, I, I don't want to feel shame. I don't want to come under the condemnation and guilt that I, I, I am something bad that not just that I make mistakes, but I'm actually the mistake um, that I'm not good enough that uh, no one understands me that, I'm always going to be alone, uh, that I'll never get things right. Uh, what's the point of trying all of that? Like that's shame and that's guilt. And I really don't want to be under that on a daily basis. I don't, I don't look forward to that. Um, it does happen, but, um, you know, a lot of this emotional stuff is all about pointing out to us where we need to be strengthened, where we need to be encouraged, uh, where we need healing. So if I can, get these emotions not running the show but guiding me into healing and into what god has in store for me um it's almost like simeon being guided into the temple so when i feel shame bubble up and say i'm never going to be good enough to get this or uh what's the point of doing this marriage thing oh what's the point of being like i'll never be faithful I, i'll never be good enough i'll never and, and so if I can hold that and go take that into the temple, just like Simeon, I can see the Savior. I can see freedom. I can see light. And I bring the shame. I bring this emotion into the temple of God. And I go, where is this coming from? What's the fear behind it? What's the hurt behind it? What's my pain? Because that's what God wants to deliver us from. And that's what true freedom is. So the emotions, they're all good. And they can lead you into freedom instead of to the beer store. And so that's the transition is almost the word subdue. I, 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 I need to subdue these. I can't live emotionalist, emotional, emotionalist, eh, whatever. I can't live without emotions. I have emotions. And especially when I'm sober, now they're all up to the top. Bubble, bubble, bubble. Yay, yay, yay. Uh, I'm feeling all of them at the same time. This sucks. Um, that's why some of us need to go to treatment center you know, for three months, six months, nine months, whatever it is, um, just so that our, our emotions can, uh, we can get off the emotional roller coaster ride. Um, our, our, our addictive minds have been so used to creating emotional distress and extreme emotion, extreme emotions. And, and so we can only handle so much and we go drink or we go use or whatever it is. And so now we want to subdue our emotions, invite God into it and let them lead us into the temple of freedom, into the temple of light. And, and that's where God's really going to shine into our belief system, into our fear. And then we ask God, we go on our knees and we go, I can't remove this. Can you do this for me? And, and so now we start to have a prayer life about ourselves. Of, of I'm in the temple now and, and I, need, I need freedom. I don't want to be bound by this fear. But my emotion has brought me here. Instead of to the bar, my emotion has brought me into the temple. Um, so you can just ask yourselves, you know, right now, what, what emotion are you most familiar of? You know, is it anger, sadness, fear, enjoyment, love, surprise, disgust, shame, insecurity, vulnerability? What one, what one do you relate to the most? Um, and then what are you the least aware of? I know in my early recovery, the, the one that I was least aware of was fear. You know, I was, I was aware of anger. I wasn't like an anger management guy. Like I didn't 
I didn't need to be in those kind of classes, like those angry people. Like I'm not a road rager until I am, until I get out of my car at a stoplight, you know, but the guy deserved it. Um, I was, I was aware of my anger all the time um, when it came out because it came out all the time, but the fear usually drove my anger. Um, do you, do you find that there's an imbalance? Um, do you see that the pleasant and the unpleasant outweigh itself? I, I thought that was interesting. Why would God give us more unpleasant emotions and, and then pleasant emotions? Aren't, aren't we supposed to be happy? I really believe that God promised us to be joyful. He's going to give us the joy of, of, of his love. Um, happiness is more of what the outside gives me for me to be happy. Joy actually comes on from the inside out. It, it, it bubbles out so you can wake up in joy. Um, you don't need the outside to be okay for you to be happy. I hope that makes sense. Um, we have a little chart that we go through in, in, in the class that I teach, and it's the emotional growth chart. And so really quickly, like there's stages of really um, subduing our emotions. There's stages of our emotions not leading us to the liquor store, but leading us into the temple. And so uh, I, this, this list isn't to condemn anybody or to make anybody feel bad, um, but it's just a list of kind of a process. And so we're all on this process. Um, I think most of us can flip and flop in between uh, emotional infants, infants to be adults. Uh, I know that I can, I can go right back to ground zero, uh, but I catch myself uh, now. And so here's, here's our list, emotional infants, emotional children, emotional adolescents, and then emotional adults. Um, so, so my goal is to be an emotional adult, uh, to have emotional sobriety, and for that to be leading me to the temple and not the um, bar. And so what does it look like in, in this kind of uh, growth chart? Emotional infants uh, look for others to take care of them have great difficulty entering into the world of others, are driven by a need for instant gratification, use others as objects to meet their needs. And so they always want to have this happiness. I need to be happy. Um, I don't feel happy, so I need to be happy. So very demanding, very entitled. Uh, emotional children are content and happy as long as they receive what they want. Unravel quickly from stress, disappointments, and trials. Interpret disagreements as personal offenses, are easily hurt, complain, withdraw, manipulate, revenge, uh, take revenge, become sadistic when they don't get their own way. They have difficulty calmly discussing their needs and wants in a mature, loving way. And so my friend Josh, he has two children um, in particular. One is four, and the four-year-old acts like this um, in, in that response where I'm not getting my way. Um, I'm not going to be happy about it. I'm just going to throw a little tantrum tantrum until I get my way. And usually that never works, but um, I'm going to do it anyway. And um, I'm still reliant on you, but I'm not happy. Uh, and then the emotional infant, he has a three month old and the emotional, the infant is hilarious because I could be holding it in my knees and rubbing her little belly. And she's like looking at me like, I am the king of the world. Like there is no other person in this world except for me. And, and her eyes are locked into my eyes and she's got this smile on her face. And then all of a sudden it goes into like this storm inside. Like her face is like, who are you? Look at the beard. Oh my goodness. Ah. And she can go into like 10 different emotions within like 30 seconds. It, it can be very confusing for an insecure man with a baby. It's like, what am I doing wrong? Oh my goodness, I broke your baby. Here, have your baby back. Why would anybody give me a baby in the first place? Stop it. Uh, emotional adolescents uh, tend to be often uh, defensive, are threatened and alarmed by criticism, keep score of what they give so that they can ask for something in return, deal with conflict poorly, often blaming, appeasing, going to the third party, pouting, or ignoring the issue entirely, becoming preoccupied with themselves, having a great difficulty truly listening to another person's pain, disappointments, and or, and or needs are critical and judgmental. And this is what we're all going to strive for on a daily. 
um, you know, every morning. I want to wake up and I want to be an emotional adult. I want to be emotionally sober when I wake up. Um, stop thinking about myself. Uh, get rid of self-pity and walk into the emotional adultness that I need. I got an adult in my emotions. Uh, so this is kind of the characteristics, what an emotional adult, what I want to strive for. Um, with the power of God are able to ask for what they need, want, or prefer. Clearly, directly, honestly. Recognize, manage, and take responsibility for their own faults and feelings. Can, when under stress, state their own beliefs and values without becoming adversarial. Respect others without having to change them. Give people room to make mistakes and not be perfect. Appreciate people for who they are, good, the bad, and the ugly, not for what they can give me. Accurately assess their own limits, strengths, and weaknesses, and are able to freely discuss them with others. Are deeply in tune with their own emotional world and able to enter the feelings, needs, and concerns of others without losing themselves. Have, uh, have the capacity to resolve conflict maturely and negotiate solutions that consider the perspective of others. And so that's kind of a, an emotional guideline, emotional uh, growth chart in a way. It's not meant to condemn anybody or put anybody in a, in a box. Uh, I know that we can, throughout our day, go from one end to the other very quickly. Uh, my goal is to be emotionally sober, emotionally adulting. And, and so the difference is where it's leading me. And so I have to subdue my emotions. I need to bring God into it. I need to bring my emotions into the temple so that God can shed light on it. God can show me where there's fear. God can show me where there's parts of me that are disconnected to him. And so I really want to get my power from God and not be powered by my emotions, not be powered by my intellect, not be powered by what I'm thinking, because what I'm thinking is where my actions are going to be. And so uh, one last little story on um, emotions is um, just, just picture uh, family. It's Saturday morning. Everybody's getting up slow. Uh, they have a two-year-old, uh, two-year-old, you know, they still have issues sleeping and, and um, that kind of thing. So they're up early. And uh, dad's reading the newspaper and mom's cooking uh, breakfast in the kitchen, some uh, waffles and bacon mm, uh, with a real maple syrup. And uh, so, so, so mom's cooking, dad's reading the newspaper, getting going, you know, uh, the two-year-old's in the, in the living room playing on the floor. And, and the, the, the two-year-old has a, a little animal called Fluffy. Fluffy has to be uh, in the crib at bedtime or nap time, or or there's things aren't going to go well. Um, the baby, the the little 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 guy can't sleep without Fluffy, and so um, Dad sees like this commotion in the in the living room, and they they have a puppy, they have a new puppy, and the puppy's shaking something. So Dad goes over, and to his horror, it's Fluffy. Fluffy is getting manhandled getting the, the life ripped out of it. And so dad realizes that this is Saturday. They want to have a nap when when uh, little child goes to nap time. And he's realizing that nap time isn't going to happen if Fluffy gets destroyed. So he grabs onto Fluffy. He grabs onto Fluffy. What happens? The puppy's jaws go, hey, we got a game on now. This is awesome. And the puppy goes harder and harder. And the more the, there's pulling, there's more that there's resistance, the dog's jaws get harder and harder and harder. And he's not letting go because he's having a blast. He's having fun. And so what happens is mom hears the noise and she's an emotional adult and can figure out some stuff. So she comes in and, and she puts bacon into the game. And all of a sudden, the dog drops Fluffy and goes towards the bacon. Doesn't that remind you of our emotions? When we have fear running the show, when we're consumed by fear, when we're consumed by guilt and shame, it actually holds it on tighter. And, and we become in a darker place. We become more anxious. We do things to even cause more anxiety. We, we, we go on our cell phones for five, 10 hours a day. We go, um, you know, try to escape in, in Netflix and all that kind of thing. We don't deal with conflict. 
it actually grows and grows and grows and and the seams of fluffy are getting um stretching and stretching and there's going to be ripping and stuffing's going to come out and we're not going to get the rest that we need we're not going to get the comfort that we need we're not going to be living properly as we were designed to be powered out of the power of god out of the spirit of god we're 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 being run and and strangled by our emotions and so that's what it truly means to me is to be subdued my emotions to bring them into the temple and not into the liquor store and so that's kind of uh what i had for you guys for emotions and uh that's that's all we got for today